Uh, so thank you for having me. I'm really excited to be here today. I'm going to talk about one of my loves, um, and uh, and that's designing uh, retail. So as Dan said, said I work at Huge. Huge is our roots are product design um, and really large scale uh, site design was kind of way way back when, um, and we were proud that we never did anything in Flash. That was kind of the that was kind of our, our badge. Um, and yet we've um, grown and become really successful. Uh, and, uh, and now we're a, a full service agency that actually does almost anything, including advertising and media. So it's, it's an amazing uh, uh, place with a lot of different types of things that we do today. And one of the types of things that we've been doing more and more is, um, is uh, physical digital and, and getting into retail and experiential design. Uh, how many of you have actually done anything in retail? Retail design. Okay, like a handful of hands. So hopefully I don't embarrass you. I think we're getting it all wrong. I think we're actually messing up uh, in a lot of our, our retail spaces. And, um, and that's in part because of the actual assignment. I, I think too often the assignment looks like this. Store's finished, where are we adding the digital? It's the second thought. It's following the fact that you've got this space and you've made everything inside of it, and then you're kind of glomming on your digital experience. Or an even worse uh, uh, assignment is, hey, we've got some screens. What are we doing inside these screens? And that's like a really lame way to get really lame ideas back, right? Because the screens themselves are already locked in, and you're not taking advantage of the most interesting part of retail or physical um, environmental design. So the real challenge here is that you're making digital the afterthought, when I would argue it actually needs to be at, at the beginning of the entire uh, conception of a space. Um, and the challenge there is that I think the outcome of those kinds of assignments is that retail becomes, or the digital becomes much more like an ad or a billboard, much more one-way communication, less interactive. I also think it means that it becomes um, harder to make cases for more omni-channel 360 thinking to get it, you know, thinking about what people are doing before they even get there and after they leave, that can be difficult. And finally, and this is my favorite part of the problem, it really overlooks the physical opportunity, the fact that you're actually in a space. Like how often do you design a website and you're, and you just, you don't know where anybody is. They might be home, they might be, you know, there's, there's this giant question mark and so you have to design for all spaces, but in this case, you get to design for one, and that's the cool and interesting part. So I would argue that we have to change our goals from I'm gonna design a store, or I'm gonna add digital, to I'm going to design a store experience. And that's where I think we come in as product designers and UX thinkers, is that we've got, we've been doing experiences for a really long time, and I think that we as a, as a group have a lot to bring to the table to actually not just say, oh, hey, someone else made the store, now I'm gonna add in a little narrow digital idea. It's actually to say we can think about the entire thing much more end-to-end. Uh, -end. So I'm gonna tell you guys three things about retail. The first is that you know more than you think, and that's really speaking to other folks who are um, who do what I do and, and, um, and develop and, um, and think about this, I think in many ways, this is just retail or some space that you're designed for. It's really just like one big product. And you have to just think about it end to end. So the foundational aspects to it are, should feel really familiar. So when I'm thinking about how I'm gonna design a retail store, I'm thinking about, okay, what are the user needs? Their motivations, their brand perceptions, which is really important. Are they angry when they show up? Or are they excited? Like, do they expect innovation or do they expect annoyance? Like what's really, you know, what are they walking in the door with? Um, making sure you're thinking through strong, clear journeys. How are they gonna return something? Could actually be a really interesting digital problem in a store that I think we could help to do interesting things with. Um, wayfindings, it actually, the muscles you're gonna use to think about wayfinding in a store is a lot like the muscles you might use to think about navigation on a website, you know? It's about prioritizing, it's about guiding, and it's about, um, uh, uh, like slowly exposing deeper and deeper as people get closer and closer to what they're looking for. Prioritizing focused messages, like no web page ever began with 10 stories at the top and did better than the one that began 
and took a really strong stand and began with one. And I think the same is true of stores. Um, and then finally, I think brand. I think if, any, if you're worth your salt, as you're thinking about designing for digital, you're thinking about the brand that goes with that. That no, no add to cart button, no view more link is the same as another when you understand what the brand is and the emotions that go with that. And that's very, very, very true for retail. So all of you know more than you think you do about designing for retail. And now I'm gonna tell you why the opposite is also true. That in many ways, whether you're used to designing uh, apps or responsive sites, there's also a hell of a lot that's really different. And to me, that's the, my favorite part of the problem. Um, so the kinds of outputs that my team does when we do we retail work. So it's things like actual floor plans, which if you're anything like me, you love the real estate section of the newspaper because you love looking at floor plans, um, then, uh, then this is for you because you can now make one yourself. Um, 3D models and fly-throughs, that becomes really important. I'm gonna show you an example of one where we actually messed something up um, pretty big until we d looked at the 3D model and understood we were, we were getting it all wrong. Um, thinking through stored journeys, industrial fixtures. So I work with an industrial designer uh, at my side and we're sketching the physical uh, sort of like the, the what you're gonna feel and touch that's next to that digital, the thing that's gonna invite you in, the thing that's gonna make you feel protected so that you're not just doing some crazy dance move exposed to the entire rest of the store. You know, whatever it is we're trying to do, we're thinking about that physical um, with it. Doing hardware evaluation and selection. I was telling someone before this, um, literally yesterday I was talking to um, my technology partners and we were joking about needing to lie on the floor so we could look at how something was looking at the, on the ceiling because we needed to get that far away from, from our projector to the endpoints. So we're like, well, let's just lie on the floor. And like, like actual hardware, I mean, you have to like touch and feel this stuff and actually understand because it's a little different than designing for a, a phone or, or a screen. Um, thinking through colors, materials, and finishes, I've actually picked out tile for stores. My husband doesn't let me to pick out tile for our apartment, but I can do it for my clients for their stores. Um, prototypes and proof of concepts, I'm gonna show you guys an example of that um, and, and where I think that, that has to take, um, it, it, it's something you actually do for a living, I think, is prototype and do proof of concept. Like it's, you're constantly running in your head a sense of how it's going to feel and, and, uh, and you'll experience it. We do things like messaging strategies, um, and then of course digital work and print work, but that's almost at the bottom of the list. Like there's so much else that goes into these kinds of problems that I think as um, product people, we should be considering and should be part of, part of what, we're, what we're doing. So here's a 3D model that we made, um, and they can really help you tell when, when you've messed something up. So in this case, um, we, this is actually the third version of this 3D model, and in the first two we had subtracted out the columns so that the client could see the concept. And it looked really great. And this is the view from the front door of the store. And then all of a sudden, one of us was like, wait a second, aren't there columns in the store? We should probably put the columns in our 3D model. And it had turned out our 3D modeler had like turned off that part of the model, and then we turned it back on and all of a sudden realized that we had literally bifurcated our main digital experience by accident because of where you're standing in that store. And we had to figure out if we need you to experience that whole digital wall we were making. Do you need to experience it from the front door? Can you experience it 10 feet in, 15 feet in? At one point, do we want to make sure that that wall was going to win? Does it need to, you know, and do we need to then shift it over so that the view from the front door is complete or not? And these things are super important. So thinking through your problem in a really different way involves trying to understand the 3D space again and again, you know, really trying to get your hands around it. And I literally, I'll prototype with my team by holding out my arms, being like, okay, this is about 10 feet, okay, I'm five and a half, you know, and we're sitting there and like literally trying to understand. And so you end up just standing up a lot and, and trying to make things real. Um, and I would argue VR is a fun extra little uh, tool for truly experiencing your space. So really getting it so that it feels holistic and you can really look around your own retail experience ahead of time can be really powerful. So I wanted to take you through a few considerations that I think are super different um, from uh, something that, that you might design uh, that's more traditionally a digital or a digital product. Um, social norms. So I had a client came to us and 
they had um, this great piece of tech hardware and they wanted everybody to touch and feel it. So they'd created these seats and they'd put the tech hardware in the middle of these seats. So people would come in, you actually could go to the store and watch, they'd come in, they'd sit down on those seats and then no one touched it. And you had to touch it to know it was good. It wasn't one of those pieces that just looked sweet. You had to actually like pick it up and start to play. And the reason they didn't pick it up is because they were sitting next to a stranger. Like it was too weird. It was like, well, are you gonna touch it? Am I gonna touch it? Like, okay, I guess I'll just sit here. And so literally like they had store of 200 stores, people would come in and then not touch their hardware. And so we finally figured out we needed to create what really felt much more like an intimate setting, a one-on-one -on -one with that hardware so that people were just really strongly encouraged, like this is yours, you're supposed to touch this, here you go. And it's being aware of the social norms of like, of what it means to be around strangers. And that's a factor of retail that's different than, than other places. Another thing is, if you really think about it, in most retail spaces, people are always moving. You're not just standing still. And the impact of that is you have about five seconds to catch their eye. And then once they're experiencing you, they actually feel an urge to keep moving. Like there's a way in which if they're experiencing, let's say it's a touch screen, and they're there to do something, there's something about the rest of the space and their own sense of their goals there. But there's something that's like, in a way, kind of constantly pulling them to keep, to keep going. And so you really have about 10 seconds, and then they're gonna be kind of, do I really wanna be here? Do I, you know? And that's true for anything that we make, except for that I think in a physical space, there's a lot more tug and pull, and a lot, it's less relaxation time of just like, oh yeah, I guess I'll just hang, you know, whatever. There's like a lot more pushing them out the door. Um, and then finally, the customer's phone is, the most popular in-store digital device. You won't beat it, you need to join it. So figuring out how to incorporate that into your strategies and into your thinking is also important. Um, I talked a little bit about this, the physical considerations. Hardware is an interesting one um, where it's not just that you have to figure out like what piece of hardware you're gonna do, but with a lot of retail clients, they have more than one location. So you have to start to multiply it. So I've worked with clients that have a thousand stores. It instantly makes any decision majorly impactful when it, you have to imagine it multiplied that much. Um, also maintenance and repair. So the more precious your experience, the more you're trying to get like four different projectors to properly you know, map themselves to each other and then you have like a push button that's being driven by an uh, uh, Arduino board, you know, like and you start to build up all these things and each one can break, the more, the more precious your experience, the more risk that your client's taking on or that you're taking on if you're, if you're in-house. Um, and then finally, goofy stuff like ADA regulations and how wide you need for how deep and things like that. Even the number of bathrooms you have to have changes state by state. Um, whether or not you have to have male bathrooms and female bathrooms or you can do um, like co-ed bathrooms, like all of it, it's, it's a fascinating world that actually becomes you know, a major focus when you're trying to figure out a full store experience and you're trying to think that way. Um, and then the last thought here around it's not the same as, as maybe what many of you have done before is that your own digital bias will be your biggest enemy um, because it's like if you're a hammer, you only see nails. There's a way in which with a background so strongly in digital, you're gonna wanna solve everything with more digital. And actually, in the end, I found out that by becoming, uh, doing um, so much work in retail lately, I've actually become more of a print designer than ever before. And thinking through these other avenues, it feels like I've gotten more old school um, in many ways. So thinking that through, um, and then my favorite, the experiences that I've produced that have done the best in store are ones that, are, that appear to be not digital at all and then they use digital to do something delightful and wow and push past anybody's expectations. It's the hidden layer of digital, not the big gigantic screen that kind of blares at you. So thinking through like the ways to go past just like big, bright, showy and get at those little touches that just like has like steam animating on a wall, you know, through a hidden projector or just different things where you can really kind of think differently about how you're communicating information and you adding digital into a space. Um, and then finally, I wanted to share some mistakes I've made. Um, there are many, there's no time for that to share all of them, but um, a few learnings that, that I would bring to you. The first is that um, to do retail, you're often working with an architect um, and they've frankly been doing UX for years. They've been thinking about product for years. What they don't have is necessarily the depth 
in digital and the depth in innovation and, and tech that you might have. And so co coming together to solve the problem from the get-go, not inheriting their answer, but actually kind of coming to that answer together is gonna to be the only way it'll really work and be amazing and, and get attention. Um, the second is um, you cannot say the word agile and then open a store with half the store gone. Like you can't MVP this stuff. Like you, you actually have to have finished the store before the store opens. And so it isn't, it, it, it literally, I mean you can use an agile methodology to execute your, your, your development. That's not the issue, but the issue is like, you know, how do you cut scope? You can't cut, it's just, you have to think differently about what can and can't go away. Um, and so a lot of times what we talk about is flexible. Um, and so a lot of stores, it's actually a lot of work to change physical structures. Digital's easy to change, physical's not. And so knowing that something has to survive three to five years, as the stories are changing around it, as the experience needs to evolve, it's all about flexible and then how you can replicate it across an entire um, footprint. Um, timelines, I was working with this one architect, all we needed was a table in the middle of the store. And he's like, that'll be about seven months. I was like, we can't go to like West Elm and just like grab a table, you know? But when you think about it, in our case, our table needed to be wired, it needed to have security in it, it actually needed, we had to pour the concrete flooring so that it actually had the power in the right way, so we need to know where the power, where it, like it actually hid the power through the legs of the table. There were all these things, all these like innovations that were built into the table itself Nothing's just off the shelf, at least not in, the, in this case. And so these timelines, like we had to decide the entire, I'm, I'm opening a store in a month, um, and we literally locked the walls last June, um, which sounds crazy, because you can kind of always move a wall, but you really, like at some point you can't move a wall. So, um, so prototyping, this is like above all, if I could just do an entire talk on prototyping, like if you leave with nothing else in mind, it should be prototyping. Like, literally like make it poorly, just cut it, cut it, you know, like we've used gator board, poster board, um, tape, we've used like five human beings holding something up so that a sixth human being can go look at it, you know, like just anything, it gets really, it, it feels, um, it feels like a startup, you know, in the sense where like everyone's just like, we've got to see it, you know, and you just kind of make that happen. So finding ways to see things early and quickly and then change them and see them again is like everybody's job, not just one person's, you know? And so figuring that out um, and looking really on the real hardware. So we had, um, you can kind of see here actually in this shot, this is a prototype in our offices. Um, we built the console, um, we put up Gatorboard on the wall, um, which was projecting around the center screen, and we realized we had an ADA issue, we had, there's a, sh a shelving unit to the side that you actually can't access because of the way we put things in. There's like, you think you can picture it, but until you've actually really walked the walk, you're not gonna know if it's gonna work or not. Um, and so that's really the, the final step in all of this. But really it's about kind of bending your brain in new ways and understanding that anything that, um, that you're creating, like you're probably, the thing with physical is that in many ways like, you're, you're always wrong until you're right. Like it's really easy to not quite know what you've done until you've gone and like built the thing. So, um, so that's it, just my take. It's been an amazing journey to go from being deep in digital design, classic product, and kind of open this door and get to have access to all this kind of thinking. Um, and I hope you all get a chance to also um, someday experience something as mind-bending as retail design. So thank you. Oh, yeah. I forgot about the Q&A. I also forgot about speaking louder. Sorry, guys in the back. Hello. I've been speaking this whole time. Did I see? Oh, yeah, sorry. Stop 
Yeah, yeah. So the question was, when you're working with so many different people, how do you actually keep moving forward and making decisions and not having to stop every time there's multiple good ideas and you're trying to really decide between them and, and figure that out? Um, I think in my case, we have a fortunate tiebreaker, which is having a client. Like, because we're in an agency setting, at some point you do, you stop, and you have to, like, wrap it up in a way that they can comprehend what you've been picturing, um, and they can often be an incredibly effective tiebreaker. Um, but I think the other part of the answer is we've ended up, we started with a team of about four people, and we ended with a team close to 70, and so the four people, like, it was their baby and their product that then the team then played out. Um, and so that helped a lot because we kind of had like, it was almost like having a godfather figure that everyone kind of went to. And it wasn't about seniority or, or you, know, you know, being a VP. It was like much more about just like, these people know this through and through and they'll, they'll help guide this to great decisions. So I think in many ways we've gotten lucky, but I'd say starting with small teams is useful so that you don't end up with like 20 people and I mean like, Honestly, like any good team, if you need the four, you need to start with three or four, you know, I'd say whether it's retail or not. Yeah. Uh. Hi, thank you for your talk this today. I'm personally working on a service design project right now and we're deploying on a bunch of ideas and we want to validate a lot of them. The client is happy with three ideas and I was wondering if you had any experience yeah, um, I you, definitely. You, I, you, I think you have to test with users. There's um, always blind spots, uh, and that's really key. The the one thing I would say that that could be helpful um, is I do think you can create tiers of testing. And um, so one of our first tiers is we actually, our poor office staff that, that sets up, you know, just our conference rooms and keeps us all fed and stuff like that, they are guinea pigs for almost everything we make at some point in the process. So starting with, like, not a complete, you know, like, but that to me, we, you can save yourself a lot of heartache going to, like, a bigger, you know, research program with, like, where you've brought everyone in and you've, like, you know, depending on how you're testing, but you've like set up a, an actual testing program. Um, but the first thing is actually just like, what are the first blush issues with it? Um, the other thing is, I think, um, what I wish we did more that I don't have a good answer for you on is how do you test like in the first two months when it like sits on a piece of paper but doesn't sit in any space? So like when your prototype is too rough to even get across to folks who aren't in the know. That's where I wish I could figure out how to like get more external input then. And I don't know if that's what you're thinking about, but I think that's a really tough moment. I don't, I don't know that I've solved that yet. Uh, two more questions, one for me. Uh, yeah. So you're probably very opinionated about retail story design. I'm curious, what is the most innovative retail story that you've had recently? Ooh. Um, I happen to, this is a slightly biased answer, um, but I happen to know the architect on the Adidas store, um, and I'm, I'm jazzed by that one. Um, I actually think I didn't work with her on the digital, and I, I, I wish I had. <laughs> I've got opinions there. But um, it's, so I don't know if you guys know the Adidas, it's, uh, let's see, like 58th and 6th, anybody know this? Okay. You all have Google Maps, you can figure this out. Um, <laughs> but the Adidas store, what they do really interestingly is there's, um, you, you feel like you're in a special space. And I think for me that's like where retail design gets interesting. Like you feel like you're walking up bleachers when you first walk into the store. It's a great use of understanding the topic at hand. Um, they actually have a race, a run course you can, you can run on. Um, and test out shoes. Like there's just little touches that they've done, but it's really just like the way they figure it out, just like the physical materials. That's where I'm, because I'm newest to that, that's where I'm most obsessed is watching how physical materials change things. Um, I also really loved the Casper pop-up. I don't know if it's still popped up. Um, 
but the Casper pop-up was gorgeous use of illustration where it would, they would illustrate a window and then just the window ledge stuck out. Like there'd be a physical window ledge with an, a pic, like a drawing, a really, it was so whimsical, um, used their blue a lot, it was, it was gorgeous. So that would be, if you can find that Casper pop-up store still in New York, um, it's, it was really, it's, that's a cool one, uh, a neat one. Yeah, I, the, it's such an interesting question, because the thing that I can't figure out is, um, are they even gonna sell anything anymore? Because we're all gonna be getting it on Amazon. So I don't know. <laughs> There's an interesting um, movement in retail to actually make it about brand experience. So all these brands want you to come in and like experience the world with their awesomeness layered on top. I mean, that's kind of what they're all gunning for. And that to me is super interesting. It, it's an interesting goal. Um, but in the end, so many of these brands, like we're becoming, I think as consumers, more and more adept at selecting objects without touching objects first. You know, and so like as we all, and especially as the purchasing, you know, the, the, the sort of people who hold share of wallet age in, you know, the ones that are very digitally centric in their buying habits age up into being you know, families and then get, you know, as, as that starts to take over, I have a hard time imagining that there isn't a major shakeup coming in terms of how spaces get used. And so, so many brands are adding coffee shops because they're trying to add experience into the space and then you'll accidentally buy something. And so, what I'm intrigued by are um, brands that come together, instead of thinking they need their own space, it's finding intersections in spaces and doing fun stuff there. I think it's, um, but yeah, it didn't really answer your question, but like, if you want something, why can't a drone, drone just like fly it to you? T try it on, I mean, isn't that the future of Trunk Club? You know, like, you just sort of, so I'm, I'm basically describing the end of this type of design because all stores are going away. But you know, like I think there's something where there's a major disruption in retail, and I guess I don't know other than to know to be like nervous. <laughs> I don't know. So, thank you all so much. So much. Appreciate it. Yeah. <laughs>